so it works every two words. Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to UC and, and welcome to uh, sunny Southern California. Um, I'm excited about this conference and I hope you are too. Um, I think that we're at this very special moment in time where we see that the, the power of polygenic prediction is, is increasing rapidly as a result of the increasingly large uh, GWAS um, sample sizes that are now approaching a million. And we have another innovation here that's happening, which is that um, increasingly social science um, data sets have high quality genetic data. And so we're really in this position starting to become sort of more powerful in, in, in studying genetics and social science uh, jointly. So I briefly wanted to introduce the organizers, which are Dan Benjamin. David Cesarini, where are you? Right there. Good. <laughs> C.G. Davis, yep, and myself. And so uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, contact an, any of us. Then I wanted to uh, briefly thank sort of the sponsors and the institutes here that are involved in the organization of this conference, which is first of all the Center for Economic and Social Research, which is directed by Ari Kaptein, and he'll soon give, us, uh, give you a brief introduction to this center. And as part of this bigger center, we have the Behavioral and Health Genomics Center, which is uh, directed by uh, Dan Benjamin. And then we have the Center for the Study of Health Inequality, which I direct. And then um, we, uh, these centers wouldn't uh, function well, without the uh, support of the National Institute of a on Aging and the Soderberg Foundation, these have made this conference possible and the existence of these centers, and so on, we want to thank them. And then there are some practical matters that I want to discuss. First of all, most importantly, the bathrooms. Didn't seem appropriate to put it as an item on the list, but it's, it's through the doors here. To the left is the men's, and through the door and upstairs is where you find the women's bathroom. Then, as you may have noticed, there's breakfast served in the morning, uh, also tomorrow. Lunches are provided, yes. I'm sorry, so the ladies, you go on the elevator, press M. You can also go up the stairs, right, or not? It's still, and then if you want, but it's still, it's still me. Okay. And if they want to go back down, we're on GL. Okay, yeah. yeah. So lunch is also provided. Uh, for those uh, speakers who have not provided the release forms, please do so. Uh, we're going to uh, video record these sessions. Uh, your name tags are not only important for, for, for that we can identify uh, the, uh, each other, but also because we have a, a strict limit of 90 people in this room and we're at that uh, limit. So please, uh, your name tag is also your, sort of your proof that you can be in this room. Um, for timing, the, 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 the talks are 20 minutes long, which is quite short, essentially, and so we ask the audience that you, uh, you ask your questions afterwards. So at the end of each session, there's room for discussion. Um, note that the agenda has changed, so there's been some last minute changes, so to avoid uh, surprises, please check the agenda. You'll find it in your folder, and also there was an email sent out last night. Um, and then for those who uh, have been invited to join the speaker's dinner, um, Please uh, note that you should be there at 5.30 p.m. sharp. It's in downtown LA, so it takes some time to get there. The best way to do this is probably to organize into small groups and you get an Uber or, or something together. Um, and then I'd like to introduce Ari Kaptein, uh, who's the director of the Center of Economic and Social Research. All right, thanks. Well, welcome to USC. Uh, I was asked to give a little introduction, of course I never know what to say, so I thought I'll talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, the center that we started uh, not too long ago. Uh, there is sort of an issue of how long you can call yourself a startup, but I thought four years are still sort of well within uh, the definition. So 
So we haven't been around for all that long. And um, as you can see, we're, we're, you know, we have grown a fair bit. Uh, we're really multidisciplinary, not because necessarily, not because anyone has told us to do that, but it just seems to be a lot more fun to have different disciplines together. And, and I think there is a real benefit in learning from other disciplines. And I'm sure you know the field of, of uh, genetics is, is another one where that definitely holds true. Um, this is sort of what we have. The economists are a little bigger than the others. There is a pretty big group of psychologists. We have demographers, sociologists. We do a lot of software development, uh, partly we do because we do a lot of data collection. Uh, but there's always room for more. And that's sort of the, the basic uh, notion uh, of what we're doing. So this um, gives you a little bit of an overview of the things we're doing. And, uh, the point here is mainly that we work on anything that we think is fun to work on. So you know, there's nothing that says you cannot work on this or we want to concentrate on something else. The, I think the common theme is really anything that helps us understand individual or household behavior in society. So we work in developing countries, uh, we work in developed countries, we work on financial decision making, we work on health. We, and, as you look at these topics, uh, many of them, of course, interact. For example, if you're interested in uh, financial decision making, you should be interested in cognitive decline, for example, if it comes to people at older ages. Well, in order to, be, uh, to, in, to understand that, you have to understand more about health and physical activity and how that affects cognitive decline. So part of the, once again, the point of working in a multidisciplinary center, of course, is that these things actually hang together. And you learn a lot more if you try to combine this information than when you try to just look within a particularly narrowly defined discipline and then try to understand what's going on. So we actually have um, a couple of offices. This is our uh, still rather new building right here. Some of you may have seen it, but many of you probably came here directly. We have another smaller office in Washington, which we like to call Caesar East. Uh, we don't own the whole building. It's like 10 floors, I think. But uh, it's actually a law, it's, it's a law firm, but we, we, we're subletting. And they have really nice offices, I can tell you. So it's actually not so bad. And then we have um, what we like to call Caesar Far East. Um, but to be a little more precise, we have one person in Singapore. And, uh, <laughs> but you know, she counts for five. So she is, uh, she is very active. And actually, having a presence there helps because we do a fair amount of, of work in developing countries. And Asia is, in many ways, the place where there is more money right now than, uh, than, in, than for example, in, in the US uh, for this kind of work, or in Europe. Um, this is another way of bragging about our reach. Uh, of course, this is a complete lie in many ways. Uh, the reason why we have colored so much of the, of the world is that we do a lot of data collection. Uh, and we do actually, we're, we're heavily involved in data collection in India for projects that Jin Kuk Lee is running, for instance, in China, um, in Southern Africa. Uh, but then some other, some other uh, parts of the world, uh, we use data that others have, been, have collected and, and we sort of assist with um, the, the structure and, and the, the software development. But then we do work, as I said, in developing countries. So there is also, you know, people do projects in various Asian countries, for example, and in Latin America and other places. We like to travel. I guess that's sort of the short of it. Um, then even though, you know, Caesar isn't all that big, we have, as I said earlier about, or showed earlier, about 65 people or so. Um, when it's growing, you really don't want to try to run it as one center, partly because I want to do my own research. Also, what we have done, we pretty much sort of, we actually encourage everyone to start their own center. That's the idea. Everyone can, well, first of all, everyone can invent their own title, right? So if you want to call yourself king, that's fine. We were, <laughs> you'll, you'll have, you'll actually, if you look at it, you will notice we have an enormous number of directors. Everyone is a director of something, which I think is just, uh, you know, just good for um, self-esteem and maybe good for the, ex for the, uh, for the external clients. Uh, but the other, of course, the other reason for doing centers is that I real, we really want to, we want people to do their own thing. We really don't want to be in the way. That's sort of the general um, philosophy. So obviously, we have a behavioral and health uh, genomic center that Dan is running, and we're very excited about it. It's growing fast, uh, like, and, and, and I think it's one of the most exciting parts of what we're doing in uh, in the, in uh, at Caesar. But then we do, we have a center for self-report science, which may seem a little arcane. Uh, but it really um, deals with the fact that asking people questions is one thing. Knowing what to do as they're asked is a different story. And I see it's just a lot of science that goes into how you ask questions, how you interpret questions, and what you do with the information. And what we're doing, 
that that's one we ask a stone. What we're doing there is not not just uh, experiment, but then we combine it with other sources of information. For example, devices that people are wearing, etc. And then we have a whole bunch of other. So we do global aging. Jean Cook Lee is, is doing that, and she is responsible for some of these big yellow blots on the on the the world map that I, I showed you. Uh, we have we do mobile health, which which is I think another really important point of what we're doing. Uh, we do uh, health and, and financial decision making all days. It's a Roybal center for those of you NI who know NIH. They, they'll know that Roybal is one of the funding mechanisms of NIH. Uh, we have the, study, the Center for the Study of Health Inequality that uh, Titus is running and that he just mentioned. Um, and then we have a program of children and family because you know we really cover everything from the cradle to the grave. That's definitely our ambition. And we also do sort of as a specific part, we do quite a bit of educational research more recently. So. And that, that's sort of where we are. Now, there's one thing that I always tend to talk about a little bit because it's uh, my own baby in many ways, which is our uh, internet panel. So we have an internet panel of about 6,000 people. And the thing about the panel is that people are recruited by address-based sampling. So in order to be in it, you don't need to have internet. But obviously, in order to actually then participate, you do need internet. So anyone who we recruit who doesn't have internet, we give it to them. So we give them a tablet and we give them um, broadband internet, which, by the way, is a pretty expensive uh, affair. But having that uh, structure then allows you to do all sorts of fun things. You can do experiments. You can collect data in, in, in many different ways. You can do sort of the traditional data collection. You have a survey, you ask questions. Or you can go uh, back every day and ask a question. And we have done this, for example, during the election when we did an election poll. Uh, or you can do, uh, you can send a prompt. You can use uh, smartphones. Uh, you can essentially communicate in whatever way is possible with modern uh, technology. And you know, this is sort of one picture that, that uh, I guess, uh, shows that. Uh, but frankly, um, you know, if you sort of think, really, what, what, what's the goal of the, of the center, of, or really, what are we all trying to do, then I, re I really think this, this really s still sums it up. Uh, and, and I really wish you a very good time in the same vein. I mean, I think really, in so many ways, I've always said, if, it's, if it isn't fun, you know, what's the point? And I think if you do research, you really have to be excited about it. And I'm sure you're all very excited by the topics today. So I can only wish you as much fun as possible. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so now David and I want to give our own um, quick welcome and introduction. Um, so first of all, welcome. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, just, we didn't actually advertise this conference at all. We just sent out some emails, and obviously there was tremendous interest, so we're thrilled. Um, you know, we're thrilled you could all be here. Um, uh, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I want to um, say something. I want to um, de describe what polygenic scores are. I know. You know, most of you know, but but just uh, uh, just to be safe, um, the idea is um, we imagine that um, that that um, we take the the true population of um, you know with no so we, we an infinite sample of individuals where we have we know the their outcomes and we have measures of J genetic variance, and you think of the linear projection the best. The, essentially the best linear approximation to the data based on those genotypes. Um, and you get, um, you get some function uh, that looks like this. Um, then you can take this piece, um, which is the, the, uh, the weighted sum of the genotypes, and that's what we call the true polygenic score. It's a measure of the additive genetic factor from the measured genotypes. And the amount of variance explained uh, in the outcome by that true polygenic score is called the SNP heritability. Um, now, of course, we can't actually construct the true polygenic score because we don't know what the true betas are. But what we can do is construct uh, a, a polygenic score based on estimated betas. 
Um, so um, there's various ways of estimating the, these betas, and, and ICU is going to talk about some of them. But um, uh, as long as it's a consistent estimator, then the beta hat that you're going to get is the true beta with some, some noise, some estimation error. And so that means that you can decompose the estimated polygenic score into the true polygenic score plus some term that, that collects together all the estimation error. In other words, you can think of a polygenic score as a measure of this true polygenic score plus some error. It's, it's basically a, a, a version of the true polygenic score measured with error. Um, so that's going to mean that it's, uh, because it's a noisy measure of the true polygenic score, it's going to explain less of the variance. So the R squared from the polygenic score is going to be less than the SNP heritability. Um, and also, because the source of the noise is the estimation error, you can see immediately that if you could estimate your weight, your beta hats, in a large enough sample, as the sample size gets large and the estimation error goes away and you get closer to the true betas, you're going to come closer and closer and in the limit capture all of the SNP heritability. OK, so why study polygenic scores? Um, there's a number of reasons. One major advantage is that they can have a lot more predictive power than individual genetic variants. So um, to, to illustrate this, I'm going to show you this is some data that's not yet published from the SSGAC. Um, Robbie's going to talk about this uh, in more detail in one of the next talks. This is from um, our uh, current ongoing study of educational attainment. Uh, currently a sample size of about 770,000 or um, should be over a million before we finish, but this is what we have now. Um, and this is, what this is showing is the predictive power we can construct from the GWAS coefficients from that sample size um, in two um, data sets that are not included in the GWAS. So these are independent samples, Ad Health and the Health and Retirement Study. And along the x-axis is um, is showing polygenic scores constructed from different sets of SNPs. All the way on the left is the fewest SNPs, just the genome-wide significant ones. And all the way, uh, the, two bar, the two sets of bars on the right-hand side are using um, all of the SNPs. And what you can see is that as you include more SNPs, the polygenic score has more predictive power. It's not true for all phenotypes, but it's true for education, and it's often true. And, um, and once we're including all the SNPs all the way on the right-hand side, we're up to about 9% uh, of variance explained in educational attainment. Um, so this is unpublished data. From published results, you can look at, you know, I've listed here results for several different phenotypes. Um, I've listed the phenotype, the, the sample size for the GWAS, the estimated SNP heritability, which can be um, estimated without knowing the true beta weights through um, several methods, like um, uh, for example, Gremmel. Um, and then all the way on the right-hand side is the R squared that comes from the polygenic scores from these papers. Um, th the best predictor is, is currently for height. That's largely because it's a highly um, uh, heritable phenotype. Um, it's 14%. Uh, BMI is up to 7%. EA from the latest paper, the Ocbe et al. paper, um, the published results using both the discovery and replication sample also explains about 7%. And then we're starting to get some predictive power for some new social science phenotypes uh, that we're recently studying. Subjective well-being is currently at 1%. And um, age at first birth, Melinda's going to talk about some, some of the other fertility work. Um, currently, uh, the predictive power is at 1%. But those, those sample sizes, uh, those predictive powers will grow, of course, as the sample sizes get larger. Um, up, up to the limit given by the SNP heritability, um, which is, of course, the maximum. Um, so, um, so, you know, one of the very nice things about these polygenic scores is that um, you can get this high predictive power even if you don't actually have a very big sample um, in, in your own data. You need the very big GWAS sample to estimate these beta hats, but then in any data that has genome-wide uh, data, you can use those estimated beta hats to construct the polygenic score um, in your own sample. And because they have this uh, uh, high level of predictive power relative to individual variants, 
um, you can be well powered to study the effects of the polygenic score in much smaller samples. So for example, for a polygenic score that has 7% uh, R squared, like the published uh, Akbe et al. educational attainment score, you can get 80% power to detect its effect in a sample size of 110 individuals. Um, if you're up to 9%, um, as our current uh, score is, than 85 individuals. So you can start thinking about you know, laboratory experiments, and certainly the size of, of a lot of social science data sets are going to be plenty big uh, to be studying the effects, uh, to be well powered to study the effects of polygenic scores. Uh, which means, you know, we can study, even though the GWAS have to be done to get these large samples, we often means we have to use coarse measures, um, and combine together lots of different kinds of data in heterogeneous environments without good controls. Once we have those polygenic scores, we can study their effects in much higher quality data sets with much better measures and the kind of um, rigorous social science models that we aspire to. Um, OK, so briefly, um, there's a lot of uh, things that polygenic scores can be used for. I won't go into detail here because Almost all the talks in this conference are going to be illustrations of these, uh, of these uses of scores. But I do want to say something about two important limitations of polygenic scores. One is that we don't yet understand much about the mechanisms by which they work. Um, so you know, it's the flip side of the fact that it includes many genetic variants. For any specific genetic variant, you could in principle learn a lot about the biology of how the variant works, but now we're combining together many of them. There's, so there's in general going to be many mechanisms through which polygenic scores matter. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there may be a trade-off in, in, in research whether you want to be focusing on just a few genetic variants where you understand how they work, that may be important for the research question you're asking, or is it more important to have um, higher predictive power and, and include many variants into a polygenic score? Um, I do think this is something that we're going to, it's going to become less of a problem as we study these polygenic scores more and learn more about the mechanisms through which they operate. Um, for example, Dan Belsky's uh, work and the talk he's going to give are going to illustrate some of, some of the work kind of directly studying um, uh, how the polygenic score plays out over the life course that may tell us something about uh, how it works. Second limitation is that currently they're, um, they're not very predictive in non-European samples. At least they're much less predictive in non-European descent samples. Um, uh, and the reason, the, the, I mean, the reason, there are a couple of reasons that could be. One is that it might be that different uh, ancestry populations have different true betas. And so the estimated beta you get for European descent samples, where most of our GWAS data come from, don't apply to other kinds of groups. More likely is that um, the LD structure dif differs. So the correlation structure differs between these different ancestry groups. And so the, the um, um, SNPs that are tagging the causal variants in one population are not the same as the other population, and, and so uh, it does a, that's why it does a worse job when you bring it to another population. Um, hopefully in the coming years, there'll be larger, I mean, I, there, there is definitely a trend toward larger non-European GWAS samples. That'll mean that we'll, um, we'll learn more uh, uh, about the right, um, uh, better polygenic scores for the other samples. But in the short term, uh, this is uh, definitely a limitation. Okay, so one thing that we want to do in this conference, since polygenic scores are just starting to be used in social science, we want to start to discuss some of the big issues that are going to come up and, um, and potentially uh, help to uh, you know, think about what kind of conventions we should have as a field going forward to make sure we're doing good research in this area. So one thing, you know, w one idea that, that we have um, is um, that we should, uh, is about the way we should be reporting the effects of polygenic scores. So often, um, a use of polygenic score, we'll see a lot of, is you run a regression of some outcome uh, on a polygenic score. It could be educational attainment on a polygenic score for educational attainment or some other outcome. Let's say it's education on the polygenic score for educational attainment. And then typically, the effect sizes are reported in terms of uh, units of standard deviation to the polygenic score. So you standardize the polygenic score so it has mean zero and standard deviation one. You say, what's the effect of a one standard deviation increase in the polygenic score? The problem with that, or a problem, uh, there are some problems with that. One is 
it's not clear how you went to, well, what do those units mean? They're specific to that particular polygenic score, and you can't compare them across polygenic scores that are estimated in different samples or, um, or, or in different ways, uh, even from the same GWAS results. What I think we would ideally want to do is report the effect sizes from a regression on the true polygenic score. That has a clear interpretation. It's the effect of the um, additive genetic variance. Uh, and, and if you could do it, then you know, if you could estimate that with any polygenic score, then it wouldn't vary across polygenic scores. Of course, we can't run that regression because we don't observe the true polygenic score. But you can get an estimate of what that coefficient would be uh, by scaling up the estimated coefficient by the ratio of SNP heritability uh, to the R squared of the particular polygenic score you're using. So that's just, um, that, that's just, that, that factor is the reciprocal of the amount of uh, measurement error bias, attenuation bias, which you can calculate. Um, and so this is just a standard way of disattenuating um, uh, estimates that are uh, biased uh, due to measurement error. And so, you know, a, a proposal that we we'll put on the table, and we can talk about it, is that in addition to reporting the um, the estimated effects in standard deviation units, also report what this disattenuated effect size would be. Now, of course, um, you know, the standard error um, on that disattenuated effect in principle should take into account as the fact that we don't actually know the SNP heritability in the R squared. Those are also estimated with error, so you have to be, you know, careful about um, interpreting the uncertainty in that estimate. But at least this way we'll get a, uh, a, an effect size in units that we understand um, and that should be comparable across polygenic scores. So let me uh, turn things over to uh, David to say a little bit about uh, why we're having this conference now. Yes, good morning. So, so I too am thrilled to see so many people sh show up. We're, we're, we're really delighted that so many people were able to uh, accept the invitations. And what I thought I'd do is just speak um, very briefly about the conversations that Titus, Dan and I had, and that sort of led us to, 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 to the conclusion that now is a good time to organize a, a conference like this. And, and um, in a single picture, the reason um, the reason is the following, and, and Robbie Weedow during his talk will talk a lot more about um, the specifics behind these numbers. Um, but the basic point and the basic reason that we're doing this right now is that um, we happen to be all working in this area, or at least interested in potentially working in this area, at a point in time where the returns, the marginal returns to additional sample size are really, really large. And so whereas, uh, you know, as, as, as recently as in 2013, we could only create poly polygenic scores with a predictive power of something like two, three percentage points. Um, um, we, we, are now, we are now sort of starting to reach levels of predictive power at which a lot more applications are becoming feasible. Um, and, um, and it's not just for educational attainment. So, and so if, you, so if you look at the, if you look at how the polygenic uh, predictive power of the polygenic score has increased as the sample sizes have increased. So on the x-axis here, I'm just showing you the discovery sample size that we used to estimate the, the beta hats in Dan's notation. On the y-axis, we're just showing the incremental R-square of a polygenic score. And the point, of course, is that we've gone from something like 2 to maybe 10 percent. Um, probably we'll have slightly updated figures um, as we moved from discovery samples of 100,000 to 700,000. And it's not just for, for educational attainment that the pattern looks like this. It turns out that you can actually uh, characterize it analytically. So this was pretty much predictable. We actually made some predictions in the original Rietveld paper. I looked back at them last night. And they were a tad optimistic, but not that optimistic. The key uncertainty is about the, is about the SNP heritability and what you, what you think that ultimately the, the, the predictive power of this G variable um, is going to be, right? And so I think we assumed that it was in the low 20s, and with hindsight, probably something in the range 15 to 20 was, was more reasonable. But, 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 but the sort of, if, if, you, if you fix that, then quantitatively these, these improvements kind of match quite well um, what, we, um, um, what we were expecting um, to see. So um, let, me, let, let me also say you know, one, one more thing about, uh, about these numbers. So, 
So back when we published the original paper, of course, one of the um, um, what, there were a bunch of reactions, many of them predictable. One of the reactions was, ha ha ha, the top variants only explain 0.02% um, of the variation. Um, and I think one of my very important points that I wish to convey is that that was the point of the study. <laughs> That's the very reason why we have to do GWAS in large samples. If you want to find individual genetic variants that are associated with uh, traits as complex as educational attainment, I mean, you, maybe you, you don't think that's a useful thing to do, but if you do think it's a useful thing to do, you have to do it in large samples. And at the time, we made a point that, that uh, we, we call this, the, the, we've been calling this the, the fourth law of behavior genetics. Um, of course, the first three laws having been proposed by Eric Turkheimer in an important paper published a little over a decade ago, I think. Um, and the fourth law of behavior genetics is really important in interpreting both the credibility of research and also in understanding things like, like this, this, this pattern qualitatively that we're seeing here. Um, the fourth law is also useful for understanding why, um, at the time, virtually all of the candidate gene work that was being done um, was not um, producing any um, sort of meaningful contributions to knowledge. And the reason is that those studies were sort of based implicitly on the assumption of uh, effect sizes that were off, not by one, but by at least two and sometimes three orders of magnitude. So those are not trivial errors. And one of the things we hope to do now that the PDS is starting to reach substantial levels of predictive power is sort of encourage people to, um, who have these small, sm smaller data sets, but sometimes they're extremely richly phenotyped, to move away from these single variant studies to perhaps encourage them to use um, PGSs. Now, I realize that, um, um, I realize that uh, um, making that transition can be, um, can be costly sometimes. And one of the things that we very much hope to do during this conference is sort of to start a conversation about what, um, how, how to get that done. So, so we've, we, 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 first of all, we, we hope to sort of showcase a bunch of good work that's being done on, on polygenic source, both theoretical that might actually ultimately um, cause us to hit the um, hit uh, come reach closer to the to the sort of to the upper bound of 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 the SNP heritability sooner, um, um, and a, a bunch of empirical work that's already being done. Um, we hope to sort of start a conversation about the sort of things that Dan mentioned already about you know agreeing on standards for sort of harmonizing how you report effect sizes. Um, and we hope to make progress on, on addressing a bunch of practical challenges that are going to arise um, when, when, w with, these, with these scores. One thing we hope to do is find ways that the SSGAC can, can, can start a dialogue about the, the sort of ways in which the SSGAC could, could contribute um, to the, this body of work. And I imagine that primarily um, that's going to come through the dissemination of scores sort of constructed using um, state-of-the-art uh, methods. And for that reason, we've actually saved a lot of, um, we've saved a lot of room for, 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 for discussion, I think more than usual um, in this, in this uh, um, at this conference. The, 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 the practical challenges are going to be um, sometimes quite daunting because of various sort of data restrictions that one has to bear in mind, both, both, uh, both at the cohort level um, and in terms of our ability to share meta and statistics. My, my, my own view is that we should just <laughs> make as much of it as available as we can, but we're sort of interested in hearing how we can do that in a way that, that, um, uh, that promotes, um, promotes uh, serious follow-up work. So that's, that's really what I, what I was hoping to say on, on this subject. Um, and, uh, I, and with that, I think I want to hand over to, to Ais, who's going to talk about her experiences and the experiences of the SSG on, SSGAC on constructing polygenic scores.
Good morning, everyone. So my talk will not be uh, based on a paper. It's just some practical considerations on how to uh, construct polygenic scores. And so if you want to also have a look at the paper, the Michigan group has a really nice paper on that. You haven't published it yet, yet though, right? It's on BioArchive. Yeah, OK. So. I'll start with what the polygenic score is, but I think, so Dan mentioned this uh, in his talk as well. It's just an index that linearly aggregates the estimated effects of uh, individual SNPs on the trait of interest. Uh, polygenic scores um, require access to constructing polygenic scores, requires access to GWAS summary statistics on the trait of interest, and it requires individual level genotype data on the validation sample. Uh, it's important to note that, uh, of course, your validation cohort should not be in the uh, GWAS discovery sample because otherwise you're overfitting. And there are so the methodologies for constructing polygenic scores differ mainly across two dimensions. One is uh, how to generate the weights, uh, and one is which uh, J loci here to include in the score, which SNPs to include. Um, the most famous, most common method, I think, is, uh, has been so far pruning and thresholding. In pruning and thresholding, you get the effects, the GWAS effects from, uh, just a regular, from just a regular GWAS, and you select the SNPs to include in the score by uh, using a pruning algorithm that, um, that ensures that markers in the score are not correlated with each other. You also then uh, exclude SNPs whose p-value for the uh, association of for for association with the phenotype of interest are uh, above a certain threshold. So you try to include more significant SNPs from the GWAS. Uh, the the purpose of pruning is of course double counting the effects of the causal variance. So if you have a bunch of correlated SNPs in the score, uh, then you will be double counting uh, the the effect. Uh, uh, of, the, of the causal variant uh, because the other SNPs are correlated with the causal variant. The reason we are thresholding, we are using a p-value threshold, is just to boost, uh, boost the signal-to-noise ratio by including genetic variants that are more likely to be associated with the phenotype. Uh, the other uh, method that is getting more common is uh, adjusting SNP weights for uh, linkage equilibrium. Uh, there are s uh, several ways to do this. There are some genomic blob methods that uh, require uh, access to the individual level genetic data of the discovery sample, the GWAS sample. So that is usually not the case. We usually do not have access to the, GWAS, the raw genotype data of the GWAS discovery sample. Which is why uh, the more practical method is LD pred by Williamson et al. Uh, that requires only access to GWAS summary statistics. And what it does basically is uh, it, it's a Bayesian approach that assumes a point normal mixture prior for the distribution of effect sizes. So a, a SNP has uh, a norm, normal distribution um, with probability P, and it's not, it's not, sorry, okay. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't it have an effect with probability 1 minus p. And y it sets the weight for each vari variant uh, equal to the mean of the posterior distribution after accounting for LD. LD is estimated using a reference sample that is supposed to be representative of the discovery uh, sample uh, LD structure. So practical considerations. With pruning and thresholding, um, so th there are a few things that we might want to consider. The first one is uh, whether to include imputed or genotyped SNPs. So it, this actually uh, it depends a bit on the genotyping chip that you have in the validation cohort. If you have two million genotyped variants, it's likely to cover uh, everything, and it should be enough for a good score. 
Whereas if you, if you have uh, 300,000 genotyped SNPs, it might not have enough coverage of the genome, so it may be better to uh, include imputed SNPs as well. Uh, do we clump or prune? So clumping is uh, done based on p-values, so you only keep the uh, most significant SNP from a locus, whereas pruning is uh, done without uh, taking into account the p-values. So as you might expect, clumping uh, gives better results because each SNP, SNP that you have is more likely to be associated with the phenotype. And uh, which clumping parameters to use? So. Um, we actually, in, in the GWAS uh, results, to get the list of independent SNPs that is associated with the phenotype, uh, we use a, an R-square threshold of 0.1. But that actually uh, is, turns out to be too conservative in my experience in this case, because so anything that has, any two SNPs that have a correlation greater than 0.1 are uh, dropped from the score. And that does drop a lot of uh, variants that act, might have independent effects on the phenotype. Yes. LD window to use uh, during clumping. So if it is too large, then uh, errors in the estimates of LD can lead to apparent LD between two unlinked loci. Uh, because your reference sample is also not perfect and it could lead to uh, erroneous estimates. And if it's too small, uh, there's the risk of ac accounting for uh, LD between actually linked loci. So what, what, in my experience, a good window is uh, one megabase. Uh, it could be a little lower, a little larger, but around one megabase uh, seems uh, reasonable. And p-value thresholds. So this depends also on the trait of the trait of interest and the sample size of the discovery GWAS. If you have a huge sample size in the discovery GWAS, uh, the causal variants are likely to have lower p-values. So it might be um, uh, sufficient to apply a p-value threshold, a, a strict p-value threshold. Whereas uh, if, I mean, in general with polygenic traits. Uh, it usually gives better prediction R-squares to include uh, more SNPs, so you have a p-value threshold close to one. This is a plot, of, plot from EA3 uh, showing the predictive power of uh, polygenic scores constructed using pruning and thresholding uh, with, a, with an R-square, clumping R-square of 0.1 uh, at different p-value thresholds. As you can see, so the uh, green bars are genotype SNPs. Uh, the pinkish bar is uh, imputed SNPs with an imputation accuracy greater than 0.9. And uh, blue bar is imputed SNPs. So there's not a lot of difference between genotype SNPs, imputed SNPs, and uh, uh, imputed SNPs with info greater than 0.9 because this is, the cohort is HRS. And HRS, uh, as I mentioned, have, has um, around two million genotyped SNPs. So the genotyped SNPs tend to cover everything in the genome uh, for EA, so there's, there's not a lot of difference between the uh, genotyped SNPs and imputed SNP scores. But as you can see, the p-value threshold really matters. So we are including really uh, independent SNPs here because the R-square threshold is uh, very strict. Uh, the genome-wide significant SNPs, of course, do not explain a lot. And the maximum here is attained around uh, a p-value threshold of 0.5. Uh, it's, it's, we have a similar uh, prediction R-square for a p-value of p-value threshold of one as well. So it tends to uh, get better as you include more SNPs. And this is uh, the predictive power of again a pruning and thresholding polygenic score with different clumping R-square and p-value thresholds. So here, uh, the green bars are uh, R-square of 0.1. Uh, it goes up to R-square of 1, which, is no, which means no clumping. So no clumping does really bad. Uh, it's the rightmost bar in every uh, p-value threshold. Uh, but it looks like um, the one does, that does best is an R-square of 0.7 for clumping. So as you include more SNPs, it tends to do better uh, here for, for educational attainment, which is also, again, a very polygenic trait. 
and I'm going on with LDPRED. So we have similar considerations with LDPRED, uh, genotyped or imputed SNPs. But here, this question actually becomes a bit more complicated because uh, LDPRED estimates the LD structure from a reference sample. So that means if we want to include uh, imputed SNPs in an LDPRED score, uh, we're going to have to have those same SNPs in the LD reference sample. And that means we either need a large and representative sample that is sequenced, or uh, we're going to use hard-called imputed genotypes to estimate LD. So if we use hard-called imputed genotypes to estimate LD, of course, that introduces some additional noise. And a large and representative sample, sequenced sample is usually not really available. So in the LD paper, they use uh, the directly genotyped data from the validation cohort to estimate LD, uh, which is a good option, but it may not be optimal in several cases. If, you, if the number of genotyped SNPs is too low in the validation cohort, for example, it may not be the optimal choice. Or if the validation cohort has been genotyped using multiple chips. Is it on? No. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? In fact, okay. So the validation cohort uh, might have been uh, genotyped using multiple chips. Then uh, your reference sample, so you will have to pull those uh, multiple chips uh, to construct a reference sample, which may introduce some additional complications. Or you may want to compare prediction results across uh, two or, or more cohorts, in which case you would want the same SNPs to be included in the score. And since the genotype SNPs are going to be different in different cohorts, uh, that's, gonna, that's not going to be optimal. So how to minimize the noise uh, resulting from imputation uncertainty while still having sufficient coverage is the question here. What I do in general is using the HubMap3 SNPs from the imputed data. So they u this usually uh, gives good results because HubMap3 SNPs are really imp imputed uh, well in general across cohorts and uh, they don't include uh, very rare SNPs. And it's, it has... Uh, good coverage across the genome. So it's around 1 million, one million SNPs, which usually uh, is sufficient for, to construct an LDPRED score. You could also include SNPs uh, that satisfy an imputation accuracy threshold, but that doesn't seem to give uh, as good uh, the result as, as high predictive R square. So also, if, the, if, we, if you want to uh, compare uh, results from two validation cohorts, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, then the, uh, the first option, including SNPs with imputation accuracy above a certain threshold, uh, it does get complicated because you'll have different sets of SNPs uh, that satisfy that criterion in different cohorts. So HubMap3 SNPs is a good option also because it takes less time to run. LDPRED does take a lot of time to run uh, when you have, I don't know, 5 million SNPs included in the score. So this is also a practical option. In the plot, uh, you see predictive power of an LDPRED score uh, with different sets, of different sets of SNPs in HRS. So the genotyped uh, SNPs uh, give the better, best results, followed by HubMap3 SNPs, followed by uh, SNPs with an imputation accuracy greater than 0.9. So it, the best option seems to be genotyped SNPs if you have enough of them. Uh, and if not, or if there are other complications, uh, HubMap3 SNPs. So more on uh, the LD reference data in LDPRED. Uh, they also uh, specify in the paper that uh, the, the, the LD reference data should have a sample size of at least 1,000 individuals, and the more the better, of course, uh, to accurately estimate LD. And it should be representative of your discovery GWAS sample. So it's, if, if, you, if you have a European uh, discovery GWAS sample, the LD reference data should definitely consist Europeans. And the closer, the more representative it is, the better, because LDPRED is a little bit sensitive to um, differences in the LD structure between the discovery sample and the LD reference sample. Uh, you need to drop uh, related individuals. So it's also important to check for cryptic relatedness here. 
you can, that can be done by estimating a GRM uh, using genotyped SNPs and dropping an individual from each pair with a relatedness above a certain threshold, for example, 0.025. And you need to drop the ancestry outliers because those would also uh, lead to uh, errors in the uh, LD estimation. If you're using directly genotyped SNPs for, uh, uh, to estimate uh, LD, the data, of course, should also have gone some, some QC uh, for SNP call rate, subject call rate, MAF, and Heidi Weinberg p-value. And if you're using imputed data, then they, you, you need to convert the data, the dosages, to hard calls. And uh, in that process, of course, some genotypes will be set to missing. Uh, Plink uh, uses the default uh, missingness threshold of 0.1 for this. And it, it's important to filter out those uh, missing SNPs, the, the SNPs with a missingness uh, above a certain threshold uh, after the conversion uh, to have a more robust LD reference sample. Uh, there is also the fraction of causal SNPs parameter for LDPRED, uh, which is kind of analogous to the p-value threshold in pruning and thresholding. And it determines what fraction of uh, SNPs are, is assumed to be causal in the non-infinitesimal model in the LDPRED. So in the paper, they find that uh, for uh, schizophrenia, for example, the optimal P is 0.3, and it's 0.03 for height. Uh, so for behavioral traits, traits which are uh, very polygenic, I, uh, it is reasonable to assume that P will be large, so P equal to 1 actually is a good option. Uh, for the uh, LD radius parameter, uh, I just suggest what they suggest in the LD Pred paper. Uh, so the number of SNPs included in the analysis divided by uh, 3,000, which is more or less equivalent to 1 mega megabases uh, again, equivalent to uh, pruning and thresholding. And the sample size. So LDPRED assumes fixed sample size across all SNPs, uh, which you uh, enter yourself. So I, I usually use the median or mean sample size there, but it's also important to drop SNPs with a very low sample size so that the mean chi-square is not overestimated. Okay, to conclude. Uh, pruning and thresholding is, uh, of course, faster and easier than LDPRED, much less complicated. But, um, so if the clumping R-square, for example, is too small, it is dr you're dropping potentially causing snip causal SNPs. If it's too large, there is a lot of double counting going on of the causal variance. But LDPRED uh, utilizes information from all SNPs by adjusting the SNP weights for LD. So that does sound better, but of course, if the reference panel is not a good match for the population from which the GWAS summary statistics come from, uh, then your prediction accuracy might be compromised. And it could be that the point normal mixture prior distribution uh, used by LDPRED is not really accurately modeling your true genetic, genetic architecture. So that could also uh, lead to lower R squares. But, uh, so in my experience, with highly polygenic traits, LDPRED tends to outperform pruning and thresh thresholding. I mean, in my experience, that has always been the case. <laughs> uh, so finally, a, con uh, a summary for of the practical considerations. I actually just mentioned these, so I, th I think I'm going to skip them. And, yeah. And last but not least, uh, it's of course always good scientific practice to report all the conducted analyses and the details of how you constructed your score uh, so that everybody can reproduce the results. Thank you. So it's something that concerned us quite a bit with um, running GWAS in UK Biobank and mm -hmm. then predicting into generation soft under some of our other UK-based cohorts. Mm -hmm. We had a data application where we could um, kind of merge bits and genotypes from two cohorts and get a, a GRM out of it. But when it comes to including cohorts at 23 and mm -hmm. what's the best practice for that? Because you don't really know who's... Well, cryptic relatedness, so it's... Just repeat the question briefly so that the video gets it. So when you have 23 and cohorts like 23 and me, large cohorts, in your discovery sample, you mean, right? Uh, so what does, how do we apply cryptic relatedness uh, filters? 
So what I meant actually uh, with the cryptic relatedness filter uh, was that you need to apply it to the LD reference sample, so the raw genotype data, uh, so that you don't have uh, related people in your LD reference sample because that would bias the LD estimation uh, that is used to adjust the effect sizes. So the cryptic relatedness in, um, in the discovery sample, I guess, I mean, there's nothing to do about that because 23andMe does include a lot of individuals and some of them will be related to others that you include in the GWAS. Uh, but yeah, so that does, shouldn't be a problem for the cryptic. Maybe I can add to that. So there, um, actually, mm -hmm. the PGC has, uh, has a pipeline to deal with that. And I don't know if it's generally applicable, but the idea is that uh, they basically convert the genotype in, uh, in the specific data set into a checksum. And then they basically just compare the checksums across the different cohorts. So that allows you to see people that are at least identical across different cohorts um, to some extent if you apply the same protocol. Cryptic relatedness, I think that that is something that you probably cannot check with them. You could check it with, a, with the Lambda meta statistics. I think Peter Fisher's team has a um, software for that. But I mean, you could only identify that there is cryptic relatedness. That you, you can't really do anything about it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm wondering uh, for the construction of polygenic form, is there any competitor for the, for the standard way? So in, in our normal doing regression, we have lots of covariates. <coughs> we enter the covariates simultaneously. So the effects of those covariates would be adjusted one another automatically. So yeah. instead of adding them up, adding the beta up. So when you do arbitrary pruning and clumping, there's always a possibility that you double clumping, right? But then if you enter them simultaneously, you will be automatically just one another. But of course, the final result might be worse. Might be worse. But that yeah. seems to be, I don't, I'm just wondering if that's a reasonable possibility. But it used to be that you have a, you know, the early, the first generation GWAS, you have 2,000 control, 2,000 patients. You don't have the sample size to do this, and you have 100,000 SNPs. Now you have, you know, 700,000 individuals, and you can enter last covariates simultaneously. I'm just, okay, I'm just mm -hmm. So covariates in the sense that the include all SNPs? Like, uh -huh. The things we do all the time. Things we just do all the time normally. We enter the conversion one single regression, so we estimate the, the, the effect of the covariates be adjusted one another, right? Yes. So you mean uh, including all SNPs in the regression at the same time? Well, as, ma as many as possible, as the uh, sample size allows. So, so there are two issues. The first is that when you're working with summary statistics, you will usually have um, cohort level estimates from a univariate regression. And so you can, and then you then meta analyze those, but in principle, then you can back out additional um, estimates of each SNP, assuming you know the covariance structure. So that's what's called, that's what Isaac touches Kojo, and that's what LD Pred does. So think about the two SNP case. So you're running a regression of Y on SNP 1 and SNP 2. Um, but unfortunately, you only have estimates from a regression of SNP 1 and a separate regression of SNP 2. You can still back out the conditional estimates, provided you know the covariance between SNP1 and SNP2. So um, the practical challenge that arises is that you don't know that covariance in your estimation sample with certainty, um, unless you have all the individual level data. And so some of the consortia, their most recent um, procedures have actually started to ask for the information about the, the covariance structure. And so then you can actually back that out exactly. But for now, we're sort of restricted to doing this in an approximate sense. So that's it's actually called, I think, the, they call the method approximate conditional bond analysis or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you have individual level data, like in UK Biobank, then it's very straightforward to do what you're proposing. You can do some sort of ridge or you know, control for everything within some LD block. Um, you're still going to have some problems because some of the SNPs are going to be perfectly collinear, so you need to somehow get rid of those. But, 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 but uh, I think that's the direction that the literature is going. You're absolutely right. But if you think about history for GWAS, the earlier GWAS, the, I think the biologists need, need before the GWAS, the biologists really worried about the false positives, right? Because yeah. they didn't so much positive. So they, they came up with a GWAS, one SNP at a time. 
they want a very clean, very stringent t value. They want very clean results. They do it one at a time. So that's why you have this data just for single snake. But then it seems to be expedient to construct polygenic score. But then maybe it's time to think about it. No, no I, I, I agree. And I think people, people are thinking about it in a sort of up, constant update and analysis for the social thing into account. But I think the availability of resources like UK Biobank will make a huge difference because then people can just do it directly and, and not concerned. You know, when you have analyses that are being done to 70 different sites, there's always a problem if you're trying to do anything on the and things can go wrong and you know, you're limiting your ability to detect any errors. Okay, let's maybe, uh, or maybe one more last question, quick one then. So, so the question, so the question is, um, if you if you have different types of SNPs that are estimated with different amounts of error, and you do a single correction for the measurement error, then you're gonna you be effectively assuming that the um, uh, that the proportion of the kind of you, you know the, you're gonna have the better measured SNPs and the worst measured SNPs, and it's the, only the effect of the better measured SNPs you're getting with your current polygenic score. So you're going to get the wrong answer when you disattenuate, assuming it's the same amount of measurement error in all the SNPs. Uh, I think that's that's right, um, but I think um, I think that the re you remember that the um, uh, I, I think that the main source of the estimation error. I think there's going to be two main contributors to the estimation error: the sample size, uh, which is constant across all SNPs, and the um, the uh, minor allele frequency. Um, and so in your example, it was the minor allele frequency that was differing uh, between the, the, the SNPs, and that was causing the difference in, in measurement um, uh, error. So the, the SNPs that are very rare are going to have more measurement error um, or more estimation error. Um, so I think that the, the, if you were worried about that, I think you could address it by um, constructing um, <coughs> Uh, polygenic scores binned by minor allele frequency, um, and then applying a different measurement error correction, um, depending on the R squared of each of those bins, and then, then, then meta-analyzing to aggregate back up to what the effect would be. But I mean, you're right, that, that could be an issue, and you need, you know, you need to think about uh, possible different measurement error.